My name is Jonathan Meads. This series of films is called Abroad in Britain, and it's devoted to the proposition that the exotic begins at home. Then he took Little Red Riding Hood home to her mother, and oh, how glad she was to be there at home where she knew she was quite safe. And the woodman took the skin of the wolf and made it into a hearth rug, and every time Little Red Riding Hood saw it, she thought of her adventure. So she tried not to forget what Mother told her, and was good and happy ever after. I've lived all my life with that painting. When I was a child, I used to spend hours staring at it in the walk-in cupboard to which my parents had consigned it. I was captivated then, as I am now, by the theatrical ambiguity of the gestures and the potent banality of the sky and the richness of the clothes and, I suppose, by the sheer art of it, though that's probably not the kind of thing you think about when you're six or seven. And what I knew of the painter seemed to belong to a strange and seductive world. He was called Peter Lucas. He wore red socks and a jacket tied with a pipe cleaner to my parents' wedding the summer before the war. He drove a Bentley. He was conscripted into the Navy and posted to the Hood. The night before that vessel sailed from Plymouth in the spring of 1941, he got drunk, he fell over, he broke his leg. He was still in hospital when it was sunk by the Bismarck with a loss of 1,300 lives. He painted this while convalescing at my parents' house, and he abandoned it, unfinished, in a garden shed. That was the last my parents saw of him. There was a rumour that he was running a drinking club near Dover. That would figure, for Lucas was a bohemian, and drinking clubs were big in Bohemia. The question is, where exactly is Bohemia? Or maybe we should cast that differently. Where exactly was it? What was it? What did it look like? And does it exist anymore? This is Fitzroy Square, Euston. Fitzroy Square gave its name to Fitzrovia, a colony of Bohemia, and, like it, as much an idea as a place. An idea, that is, of social demeanour, of the primacy of art, of sexual freedom. It was here, in the 1890s, at the house of the architect and utopian economist Arthur McMurdo, that Wilde was introduced to Shaw. At that time, the painter Walter Sickert had a studio here, and so, inevitably, did Augustus John. The word bohemian to connote a social type derives from the French misconception that gypsies originated in Bohemia, i.e. what is now the western part of Czechoslovakia. This usage was commonplace in England by about 1870. The popularity of Puccini's opera and of Henri Merger's novel and play upon which it was based is at least partly ascribable to bourgeois schadenfreude, to a gloating voyeurism and ghoulish delight in the antic lives of flaky vagabonds. It's also partly ascribable to romantic pathos. Consumption, but not TB, is always good for a tear or two. No disease is more morbidly glamorous, and no disease is more specific to bohemia, save, of course, DTs. Was Bohemia purpose-built? Can one architecturally determine non-conformity, even non-conformity so conformist as that of Bohemia? One can certainly purpose-build for the making of art, which may or may not be the same thing. Well, I guess uh, the moment I arrived here, I just knew that it was tailor-made for me. Um, I'd had a lot of experience of working in, in hired studios and I'd had a couple of studios of my own previously. Um, but they tended to be black painted bunkers where, where you just use them like sort of concrete shell. This had a very sexy vibe. Uh, I know sexy is a misused word a lot, but it, was, it, it is a sexual building. This it, It's definitely got a good history 
and you can feel it when you come here, and the daylight is, is sparkling, it's phenomenal. Okay, take your, take your eyes up towards the light, just over there. Great. If you go blue placking around here, Chelsea and the adjacent quarters of West London, you'll come upon the studios and houses of the high bohemians of the last century's 80s and 90s. But the importance of these buildings is much more than associational. The importance of buildings that are any good always is. On the Queen Best Slept Here principle, you could of course devise an architectural itinerary according to where Wild buggered. But the point of these buildings of Bohemia's golden age, the only age when Bohemia had buildings that were peculiar to it, is that they belong too to a golden age of British architecture, from roughly 1880 till the outbreak of the First War. Very few studios had been built previously, very few would be built subsequently. During these 30 or so years, they rose up all over West London, the studio was the emblematic building of its period. It was a self-celebratory type of building, doubly self-celebratory in that it celebrated painter and architect, patron and maker. These places were by artists for artists. They thus possessed a sort of incestuous purity. Those who created them and those who lived and worked in them were proclaiming the paramountcy, not necessarily of art, but of the artist a secular god who stood apart. Studios also celebrate and memorialize an age which was uniquely generous to living artists. Lots of painters made lots of money. They could afford to build for themselves in a way that is unthinkable today. And painters still painted by natural light. Hence the characteristic fenestration of studios. Now that painters seldom use natural light, Studios of this sort are functionally redundant. They are relics of an outmoded technology. But that does not mitigate their architectural worth. Architecture has very little to do with function. This is a fine building, a fine domestic building. Its consumptive architect, James McLaren, may not have so conceived of it, but it does make adequate flats for the disadvantaged middle classes. All the bohos have scarpered leaving behind only bad debts and bad sputum. They've abandoned their weird buildings and left no forwarding addresses. God, they're so unreliable, these people. Rossetti Studios, Channel Gallery Studios, 38 Tight Street, 147 Kings Road. There were few studios in Chelsea that Augustus John did not paint in, and there were few beds in Chelsea that he did not make friends in. He was a man of abundant creative and procreative energies. He commissioned this studio in a pub one night in 1913 from a Dutch architect called Van Hoff, whom he'd never previously met. It's apt that the last work of the great studio building era should have been commissioned by John, for he, more than anyone else, kept alive the idea of late Victorian bohemianism throughout the century. But it was not in London that he ensured its survival. Chelsea is not called Bohemia. I'm not about to leave the royal borough of Kensington and Bohemia. The things I used to wear on my feet were not called Bohemia boots. There are, amazingly, four places in England called Bohemia. Why should that country, that far-off country of which we know very little, according to the terminally provincial Neville Chamberlain, why should that country have exerted such a toponymical hold on this one? Look at it this 
way. How many places do you think there are in Western Czechoslovakia, between Prague and, say, Marianske Lazne, called England? There's Bohemia North Yorkshire, there's Bohemia East Sussex, there's Bohemia Wiltshire, there's Bohemia Isle of Wight. That's four Bohemias, one for each of the centuries since Bohemia became a fixture of fantastical folklore. Did you know that Little Red Riding Hood was a Bohemian girl? There's a statue to her in Marianske Lazne. Local girl makes good in sexual allegory. We must be getting warm. Bohemia was with us long before La Boheme. Shakespeare went along with Neville Chamberlain. Well, they were, after all, both lads from the Midlands. In A Winter's Tale, Bohemia was a desert country near the sea. It was the epitome of foreignness, of the unknowable. It really might have been the home of gypsies and of dandy rovers. Anything was possible there. It was an idea as much as a place. Perhaps all places are ideas to those who don't live in them. These names, Palestine, Canada, No Man's Land, touchingly optimistic names, suggest squatter colonies, the grabbing of agriculturally indifferent land by poor people. This is the underbelly of the countryside. So here it is, Bohemia Wiltshire. You see rural squalor. I see the site where idea and place once coincided. Over there, across that heath and beyond those hills, is where Augustus John led the last 40 years of his life. This once was the Bohemian's Bohemia. It was like the killer called Butcher, the tart called Hooker, the policeman called Bent. What we have to ask is this, does anything remain of John's free state, of that singular society? Will we recognize the dinosaur's footprint when we come upon it? John was the king of Bohemia, and this was his palace. Only palaces have listed plywood doors. All around him, on the furzy heaths of the forest and in the Avon Valley, there gathered his courtiers. This house, Fryan Court, was an object of their pilgrimages. And John, his family, his entourage, his mores, especially his mores, affected and coloured this patch of then remote rural England. But while the Chelsea Bohemia, in which he spent his artistic and amorous apprenticeship, has left us tangible evidence of itself, one has to scratch hard for traces here, on the edge of the New Forest. The original studio at Fryan Court was built in 1901, two decades before John moved here. It belongs to the era of his early manhood. He was comfortable with it. This bucolic eye-catcher had a messiness that suited him. He was not, however, comfortable with this studio. It did not suit him. This was an odd commission, a token gesture towards modernism by a painter who was nearing 60 and who was identified with a world, was indeed the creator of a world in which worship of the machine played no part at all. Kit Nicholson, who was to die in a glider accident, plywood was with him in death as in life, designed it for him in the mid-1930s. It had no ground floor. That was added only a few years ago. 
For a long time, the space beneath the neglected studio was used for storing bales of straw. John had abandoned it after a brief trial. That's hardly surprising. I doubt if it had anything to do with the studio's efficacy, everything to do with what it stood for. The new architecture of the 30s symbolised order and neatness. It was bloodless, geometrical, cerebral, and possessed of a pureness that had no place in Bohemia. John and his art are exemplars of the extreme romanticism I intend when I refer to Bohemia. That art, that sort of life, is inclusive of everything. It does not flinch from emotional nudity. It is unsqueamish. We, wrote John, are the sort of people our fathers warned us against. <laughs> there is a direct link between John's subject matter and the area that he made his own. These apparently endless heaths, these scapes of gorse and firs, are the closest thing there are in this country to the Mackey, to the scrubland of the northern Mediterranean basin. That is the country of gypsies. It's also, significantly, the country of Picasso's mountebanks and circus people. It's hardly surprising that this landscape should appeal to a man who made a cult of gypsies, who knew their law and spoke their dialects. He tried to encapsulate in his life a sort of idealised gypsydom. To become a gypsy is to achieve the very grail of bohemianism. But there is a grotesque gulf between that which is, if you like, gypsy-inspired, the architecture of castanets and flamenco. There's an indecent gulf between that and the actuality of the traveller's life today. There is little romance in outlawdom. There probably, in truth, never was much. Is bohemianism genetic? We must ask Mr Gabriel Summers, whose mother was formerly married to Augustus John's son David, whose grandparents, Gerald and Nora Summers, were at the Slade with John and followed him to the Hampshire-Dorset borders. I suppose the collecting uh, bug came to me quite early when I was <clears throat> very young. I remember I used to be quite keen on collecting sort of scrap metal, preferably very rusty items. And a special treat on Sundays when I was sort of uh, sort of infant was to go up to the local tip where there were quite a few gypsies and things living up there. And I used to root amongst the, the old junk and pick up sort of curious items of metal and just junk and stuff of that kind which I collected early on. And since then, I suppose my interests have broadened a little bit, and I'm sort of interested in really collecting anything uh, that has a curious or unusual character to it, be it paintings or ornaments or artefacts or you know, anything that appeals for one reason or another. Well, this house was originally a small farmhouse to which my grandparents moved in the 20s. And then my grandparents enlarged the house making it considerably larger, building on, for example, this room and also a studio uh, in the grounds, which they used, um, which has subsequently fallen into decay and collapsed, and that's why I use this room as a painting room. Um, I remember in my youth, one of the chief occupations that I did in those days was to rescue all the uh, paintings from the old studio, because one found quite a lot of... Uh, sort of interesting paintings, both by my grandparents and some by Lamb and John and other painters that had just been left there to decay, you know. So painting seemed like a natural activity to pursue. Well, I suppose throughout the house, there must be a hundred or more paintings uh, that I've done. I mean, they're sort of dotted around the house in various places. Uh, most of them uh, are figure paintings uh, in sort of landscapes with flowers and things, uh, usually sort of nudes with cherubs or cupids and things of that kind. Um, and um, I usually sort of work mostly from imagination. 
painting sometimes the trees or flowers or accessories sometimes from life, but the figures and uh, the children or cupids and things that appear are usually done from imagination or memory, uh, <coughs> that kind of sort of source for, 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 the, uh, for the imagery. Bohemianism is, as much as anything else, a state of mind. It's a state of mind that's not much adhered to around here nowadays. This house is an oasis. It's one off. It's as much out of place as it is out of time. The question is, does there still exist in this apparently post-Bohemian age a conjunction of name, place and state of mind which approximates to that which existed in the New Forest 50 years ago. Let's try this Bohemia. This is the most populous of the British Bohemias. This is Hastings, of which Bohemia is a suburb. Now the question is, do the people fit the name? The place certainly does. The entire town of Hastings should be called Bohemia. Its predominant characteristic is that of being unfinished. It possesses the randomness, the chaos, the juxtapositions of the sublime and the pathetic that inform Bohemian lives. It's kind of overripe, blousy. It has a bruised amiability that only the fallen can ever achieve. Any urban organism is a work in perpetual progress, but this is different. It's a series of abandoned works which attempt to occupy the same canvas. In the canon of British townscape, there's no place that so flaunts collisions, chance encounters, stylistic brawls. Its heterogeneity is savage. This is a town whose buildings lack any sort of consensus. They all, as is still said here, do their own thing. I'm not talking merely about buildings of conflicting scale and style engaged in some sort of rumble. Nor about the topsy-turviness of the place which is abetted by the precipitous hills and re-entrance. The individual buildings here are gloriously impure. They bear the scars of successive attempts to modernise them. Their integrity, their wholeness, has never been respected. They have been endlessly rewritten in the style of today, yesterday, the day before yesterday. This is the very obverse of the official Britain of showpieces, of tourist board cuteness, of places which pretend to perfection. These houses and this town were not built for artists and their groupies. Much of Hastings was built to be let, houses for sea bathers in the summer and invalids in winter. It is by chance that it has become a bohemian mecca, and its aptness for that role is similarly fortuitous. Well, I think the first, first thing that attracted me to the place was its seediness. It's wonderfully run down um, in a most uncontrived sort of way, um, and especially the fishing beach, which I am always frightened is going to be tidied up by the council or something. And uh, the messier it is, the more I like it. It's, it's, I suppose you could say it's my notion of house and gardens. Yeah, the other thing is the wonderful light. I mean, before we were living in London, you're never aware of the weather. And it's incredible. I mean, the sea changes colour all the time. Sometimes it's bright yellow and purple. And the sky is grey, I mean, almost the opposite of it should be. Um, but funnily enough, um, I'm not working directly myself from the, um, all the paraphernalia around here, although I'm sure I use some of that atmosphere that I've absorbed when I'm working in my darkened basement. Um, I think people think I'm crazy uh, with a view of the sea when I'm working in a, in a cellar.
This is a colony of ready-made nests, a town that has been invaded by painters. The question is, are they going to leave their mark on it, the way their precursors did on Chelsea? Or is it fated to be the other way round? Will the place mark the people? It may well. It really reeks of itself. It's visually assertive. And that may, in some odd manner, dissuade today's painters from amending it. There's an extent to which architecture is antithetical of painting. Painting represents, it refers, it has subject matter. Architecture doesn't. It's opaque. It's mute. One of the attractions of this seaside bohemia is its very imperfection, its artlessness. And to muck about with that artlessness would be to dilute the very essence of the place. poet's home, the house of Usher crossed with ancient Rome, including all the pets that you could need, seeks gothic owner, price to be agreed. The spider's webs are hammer horror class, two seagulls wrapped like Cathy at the glass. A banshee keens all night, cries evermore, it's Sunny Jim, their child, he eats for four. The tower has flies and an Italian ghost. A slant-eyed tomcat haunts the basement boast. The halls adorned with cupids set in rows. Some still have wings, but most have lost their bones. The moon dials slow, the belfry has no bell. A hundred pigeons squat in it as well. An opening could be made for bats, no doubt. Potential's what this house is all about. girl from Mariansky Lasny. You would find her here. I need hardly tell you, this is the Bohemian Bohemia. We've arrived. Thank you. 